Good evening. Hope everyone has had a very enjoyable Lord's Day. It's been relaxing, I know that for, for me. All right, well, for our opening hymn this evening, if you'd join me in standing if you're able, and we'll turn to 527, or you can look at the screen behind me. Glory to his name. Amen. I could see from the look on faces that you believe that. What a great Savior. Glory be. Please bow in prayer with me. Lord God, we thank you so much um, for this body that you have called and made us a part of, for having called us to your Son, and in him we can be complete. All of the sins that, uh, that plague us, we can leave behind us. We thank you, Lord, for the example that, uh, that you give us uh, in your word, and we thank you for the way it guides our steps as we go through this world. If we'll just trust you, put our faith in you, obey your commandments, and love you, you're there for us, a steady anchor always, and we give you praise for it. Please go with us now as we go through this hour. Help us, Holy Spirit, all the teachers, all the workers, those who are bringing the word and uh, trying to help us to become more like your son. Help us to tune into that message well. And I ask it all in Christ's precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Our second song this evening is Anywhere with Jesus. You should have an insert or you can follow behind me.
Pastor, would you like to do scripture, please? For our scripture reading, I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah chapter 14. Once again, a theme of judgment. You're not surprised at this point to see that. Uh, maybe, maybe we should be reading more of this book so that we can get that, that bigger idea in our heads. It, otherwise, it sort of feels like we're being slammed with that same theme week after week after week. But at the same time, I think that's by the Lord's design. I think he desires us to see the seriousness of sin as a result of his people's experience with their sin and the consequences that they received because of that. So we're going to see once again that the Lord takes sin seriously as we look at Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns, and her gates languish. Her people lament on the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem goes up. Her nobles send their servants for water. They come to the cisterns, they find no water. They return with their vessels empty. They are ashamed and confounded and cover their heads. Because of the ground that is dismayed, since there is no rain on the land, the farmers are ashamed. They cover their heads. Even the doe in the field forsakes her newborn fawn because there is no grass. The wild donkeys stand on the bare heights. They pant for air like jackals. Their eyes fail because there is no vegetation. So what is the problem the Israelites are facing at, at the beginning of this chapter? Drought. When, when we experience natural disasters in this world, can that be an expression of God's judgment? Absolutely. It is so easy for us in our modern scientific age to immediately draw conclusions about how these things happen in naturalistic terms. Of course, there are scientific explanations for the weather in our world, but we also understand that God is in control of the weather, and it does accomplish his purpose. And so it would be foolish for us to ignore things like that when God can use them to get our attention. And he also is using them to get the attention of people who do not understand that he is in control of the weather. You and I have the opportunity to point other people's attention to that fact. Verse seven, though our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. O you hope of Israel, its savior in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? Why should you be like a man confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Does that seem like an appropriate prayer to you? I think it does. Let's see how the Lord responds. Thus says the Lord concerning this people, they have loved to wander thus, they have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. The Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. And though they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Now that's a surprising response on the part of the Lord, isn't it? You don't expect the God who is merciful, who is compassionate, who is gracious, who is patient and long-suffering to respond to a prayer of confession and intercession like that. But it shows us that there does come a point where God's judgment is inevitable. And the warning is to repent and to turn away from that sin that causes that judgment in the meantime. Um, and beyond that, we have to trust the Lord with judgment. You and I as Christians are not the ones who determine how God responds to sin but we can trust him to act rightly in the face of that sin. Verse 13 goes on to give us Jeremiah's response. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. What's going on there? You have, you have a false message that is being proclaimed. And the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination and the deceit of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, 
and who say, sword and famine shall not come upon this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem, victims of famine and sword, with none to bury them, them, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. For I will pour out their evil upon them. You shall say to them this word, let my eyes run down with tears night and day and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. If I go out into the field, behold those pierced by the sword. If I enter the city, behold the diseases of famine. For both prophet and priest ply their trade through the land and have no knowledge. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Does your soul loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, but no good came, for a time of healing, but behold, terror. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? We set our hope on you, for you do all these things. Once again, we see the condemnation of the leadership of the, of the nation of Judah. And that, of course, is a warning to anyone who would claim to speak for God. We have people like that in this church, don't we? If that is your calling, then you had better take that really, really seriously. What should you do if your pastors start speaking things that God has not revealed to them, that God has not said? Yeah, yeah, get, get, get rid of them. Confront them first, but, but, but get rid of them, right? Because the truth matters. And you should expect that those who are teaching, those who are preaching, those who are handling the word would be knowledgeable in that word. That is God's expectation for those who proclaim his word to others. What happens if you have shepherds who do not know God's word and are not faithful to God's word? You're going to have a sickly congregation. You are going to have people who are not being confronted with the truth, and they are going to wander. They are going to stray deeper into sin because that's what flocks that are not being tended properly do, right? They disperse. They go all sorts of places where they're not supposed to be, and unfortunately, that happens in many places. So may the Lord in his grace never allow that to be the case here at Cedar Creek Bible Church. May we be faithful to the word that he has given to us, and may we be faithful to obey that word each of us individually in our own lives. For our final hymn this evening, before Pastor brings the message, number 560, For the Beauty of the Earth, I'll invite you to stand again if you're able.
You may be seated. Well, as most of you are aware, we are not going to be turning to the book of Daniel this evening because we were able to finish that up last week. That, of course, was a great joy, I trust, for you. It certainly was for me to be able to grapple with all of the difficulties of the book of Daniel. And hopefully you feel like you have at least somewhat better understanding of that book as a result of the time that we spent there. Over the next couple weeks, what I would like to do is think a little bit about our understanding of eschatology in general. And eschatology is one of those fancy words that describes something that we're all familiar with as Christians from reading our Bibles, and that is the fact that God speaks about the end times. God has things to say about what is still future. He has done great and incredible things in the past, but he has a plan that is working itself out through all of human history, all of the history of this universe, and eventually he will accomplish everything that he has planned to accomplish from the very beginning. And we saw evidence of that in the book of Daniel, did we not? We saw the kind of control, the kind of sovereignty our God has over events, even in this fallen world. And God has still made promises that have not yet been fulfilled. So you and I can look back on the evidence of God's faithfulness, and then we look at the future and we conclude, God is going to be faithful. He is going to do the things that he has said from the very beginning he will do. Is that an encouraging thought? It should be, because our God is completely trustworthy. Well, tonight I'm going to make use of the PowerPoint to sort of organize the message. We're not looking at one particular passage, and so hopefully this will kind of help us to follow along with some of the ideas that I'll be presenting. And I'd like us to start by thinking about this matter of the future. And I'll see if this works to allow me to do that. And so we're going to start by asking a really basic question. Why does the future matter? Well, you could make the argument that the future doesn't really matter. After all, it's not happening now. You and I can't control what's going to happen. At the end of the day, it's all gonna work out the way it's supposed to. And there are Christians that view the end times, that view eschatology in that way. You, you could go through your life as a Christian not really thinking very much about the future. My conviction is, as a, as a Christian, as a pastor, as somebody who has studied the Bible and is trying to understand it better, is that the future does matter. And there are several reasons why I think that that is the case. Why does the future matter? Well, for one thing, God spends an awful lot of time talking about it. Is that true based on your reading of Scripture? Have you noticed that? That absolutely is the case. So, as, as we think about the kinds of things that we're going to emphasize in this church, the things that we're going to spend our time thinking about, the doctrines that we're going to spend time emphasizing, we wanna make sure that we are paying attention to what God and his wisdom and his knowledge has chosen to emphasize. Now, there are, there are churches that choose to follow a different path. We could, if we wanted to, poll our community and find out which topics are interesting to them and then we could structure the things that we talk about, the messages that we craft in such a way that they would find our church and our services appealing. Does that sound like a good strategy to you? Well, it might sound like a good marketing strategy, but I don't think that it's a good strategy for the preaching ministry of the church because God knows what we need even better than we, what we know of ourselves. So we wanna make sure that we are not emphasizing the things that we think will attract people, but the things that God really knows that we should be concerned with. And that's a conviction that we strive to live out, that we strive to carry out in the preaching ministry of this church. And as it happens, one of the things that God absolutely spends a lot of time emphasizing in his word is the future. Now, there are some Bible prophecies that were future predictions when they were originally given that have been fulfilled. We've seen them in Daniel, right? But then, beyond that, there are other prophecies that we are still waiting on to be fulfilled. But as originally given, when we think about this category of prophecy, predictive revelation, as originally given, as much as a quarter of the Bible is prophetic. That's a big chunk of our Bibles, isn't it? When you think about the amount of prophecy that our Bibles contain, that is really quite staggering. Uh, J. Barton Payne puts the figure actually at about 27%. He suggests that about 27% of your Bible 
is predictive in nature. And I think that that pretty clearly suggests that God wants us to spend some time thinking about the future and wrestling with its implications for us. And there, as it happens, is a really great illustration of this in our New Testament. So think for a moment with me, if you would, about the church of Thessalonica. What do you know about the origins of the church of Thessalonica? Okay, so if you draw from your knowledge of First and Second Thessalonians, as it happens, we have two letters that are directed specifically to that church. You become aware that they were grappling with these matters of, of future things, what was going to happen and how we're supposed to live in the meantime because of that. But from the very beginning, the Thessalonican church, they had interaction with the Apostle Paul. He was not with them for very long. If you read the book of Acts, what you conclude is he was actually with the church in Thessalonica for three Sabbath days. How long is that? Yeah, maybe just over two weeks. He was not with them very long. And yet the amazing thing is, when you read the books of First and Second Thessalonians, Paul alludes to the fact that he was explaining to them all sorts of things about what the future would hold. How many, how many of you in discipling young believers have made future things, eschatology, a major emphasis of your immediate discipleship with those believers? That's not usually the direction our minds go, is it? And yet we see Paul saying specifically to these Thessalonians, talking about the future, giving them very detailed theology. He says, do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And so that tells us that eschatology was a big deal to the Apostle Paul. He considered it worth sharing even with new believers who had just recently accepted Christ. So while at the, well, on the one hand, we don't want to fall into the trap of making such a big deal out of eschatology that we divide from other believers who have a different viewpoint than we do or we view them as enemies or as not being genuine Christians or something like that. We don't want to fall into that trap. On the other hand, we do understand that end, the end times matter, and God wants us to grapple with that. And the fact that he spends so much time talking about it is absolutely evidence of that fact. But there's a second reason that the future matters, and that is that it vindicates God's sovereign rule in this world. When you look at this world, how much evidence do you see that God is the one in control of it? It's a little bit of a mixed situation, isn't it? because we also see evidence of Satan's working everywhere. We see evidence of the curse. We see evidence of the fall. And the question that then remains for people who are looking at it from a neutral standpoint is, well, who's gonna win out in the end? How do we know that God is actually on the throne? How do we know that he is the sovereign of the world? Well, it is the fact that one day he is going to fulfill all of his promises and he will be the one who wins out in the end. And so, that is one of the things that gives you and I confidence as we live in a world where it looks like sin has the upper hand, where it looks like Satan is exerting his influence, where it looks like evil people are continuing to do evil things. It's a question believers have asked down through the ages, right? Uh, do you remember what the psalmist said? Why do, why do the wicked prosper? How, how, how do you explain the fact that, that evil doesn't seem to be being dealt with? Well, one way that we understand that as Christians is we recognize that God is merciful. He is giving people time to come to know Christ. He is giving time for the gospel message to change hearts, to change lives. But there is eventually going to be a day where God will finish the deal. He will make everything that is wrong right. And that will involve judgment. And so we look to that in the future. That, that really does matter as we see the sin around us in the here and now. And then a third reason why the future matters, and I think we can absolutely defend this from our Bibles, is that it motivates our right behavior in the present. How many of you as parents have ever left your children at home by themselves and you told them that you wanted them to do some things and you said, I'm gonna check on you when I get back. I'm gonna make sure that you've actually done these things. Do you think that encouraged your kids to actually do what you told them to do? Absolutely. I certainly remember times when I was growing up with my brothers where we would be given a list of things that we knew had to get done and we would put them off as long as possible, but there would come a point when we realized, you know what, we're in dangerous territory. If, if, if we don't get these things done, then there are going to be consequences. And that's, that's true as we think about the return of Christ specifically. That is a major future event that you and I are waiting for. And it does motivate the way that you and I live our lives in this world. 
And I'm just going to, to read a, a, a handful of verses that, that make this very point. These are all verses that come in the context of giving predictions, talking about the future. And then they conclude by giving an exhortation to you and me as Christians about how we're supposed to live. Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You and I should be thinking about what sort of people God has called us to be, given the fact that this world is passing away and its lusts. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, passage that concludes the discussion about the rapture of the church. At the end of all that, what does Paul tell the church they should do? Encourage one another with these words. You and I can encourage one another with our knowledge of what is yet to come. 1 Corinthians 15, what is that chapter known as? That's the great chapter on the resurrection. In the whole Bible, if you want to know about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 is where it's at. And at the end of all of that, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul concludes, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, whether we are at home or away, talking about being present in this life, in this body, and talking about uh, the spirit being absent from the body, we make it our aim to please him. And then finally, 1 John 3, verses 2 through 3 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. That's a future promise. That's something you and I are still looking forward to. And what is the consequence of that? And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. You see that throughout your New Testament, that God reveals the future, and then he says, because of this revelation, you need to live this way right here, right now. And so you and I care about the future because it is one of the things that motivates us to live the way that God has called us to live. So I think it's pretty clear that the future matters, and I think it should matter to us. Now, I don't doubt that it's true that there are some of you that really are interested in eschatology. You get excited when you, when you, when you see a chart that lays everything out, right? Or you get excited when we start diving into a book like Daniel or a book like Revelation. Others of you are like, please, no, not, not that, <laughs> anything but that. And my encouragement to us is that wherever you fall in that spectrum, we, sh we should be able to objectively agree together that God cares about the future, and, and we should strive to understand and appreciate it for what it is as well, whether that's your natural inclination or not. Well, one of the things that we see right away as we start engaging with this matter of the future is that God's plans for the future revolve very closely around the kingdom. And so we're going to start thinking about the kingdom in biblical theology next. So what is this kingdom that is supposed to occupy our attention? This kingdom that is supposed to motivate the way you and I live, that is supposed to vindicate God's rule in this earth? Well, the kingdom of God is a major theme of the Bible. And there, there are many theologians who could, uh, who could give testimony to that. One says the kingdom is, is the central focus of biblical theology. Another one says the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth is, in fact, the ultimate goal of biblical history. And then finally, another says, indeed, the kingdom of God concept is the heart of the biblical philosophy of history and therefore is the central theme of the Bible. Now, it's kind of challenging to take a whole big book like the Bible and to boil it down to one single theme. But I think that you can make a good argument that the kingdom really is the central theme of the Bible. I think you could make an argument for other, other possibilities, but it really does describe pretty well what's going on with the kingdom. Well, we better think a little bit about what constitutes a kingdom. How do you know that you have a kingdom? Well, you have a ruler, right? And then you also have a realm. God, of course, is the ruler. We understand that in general. Is, is there a more specific understanding of the kingdom beyond that, just that God generally rules over all? Yeah, we understand that Jesus specifically is the son of David and that he is the one who will reign from David's throne. 
So that is a more specific understanding of uh, the matter of the rule of this kingdom. Jesus himself is king, not just God generally. And all creation, in a very real sense, is the realm. God created all of it, he owns all of it, and he will redeem, he will, he will bring it, all of it into subjection to himself. That being said, is your experience in this world today that God is the ruler of everything, or do you sense that there is a rebellion afoot? Yeah, there, there, there certainly is rebellion in our world. And so there's also this spiritual aspect to God's reign. It's not just that God is in control of everything, that he created everything, that he will one day force everything into subjection to himself. It is that he is establishing a spiritual kingdom, which you are a part of as a believer in a way that your unbelieving friends are not, because you have been brought into a personal relationship with this ruler. And so that's a unique aspect to this matter of the kingdom. And that really is quite, quite central to our understanding of what the kingdom is. Something we see in the Bible as we, as we, as we address, address this matter of the kingdom is that it has a future component, but it is also presently at work. Are you doing that? Let's do that. Thanks. And so the way theologians have grown accustomed to describing this is using already and not yet language. And basically what that means is we're saying that the kingdom of God is present. When did the kingdom of God come? In a very real sense, it came with the person of Christ because he is the king, right? You need the king in order to have the kingdom. And people refer to him rightly as the son of David. And so the kingdom comes primarily in a person. But he is not yet reigning in the fullest, most final sense that he one day will. And so we understand that there is both an already and a not yet aspect to the kingdom. That helps us as we grapple with this matter of the kingdom to recognize that. We also have seen that the kingdom is a central theme of the Bible. Do you see the kingdom in the very beginning? Well, maybe not in so many words, but I would suggest that in the creation of all things, you absolutely have reference to the kingdom, right? God has created a realm in which to rule, and then he mediates that rule through the people that he created. What did God want mankind to do after he created them? Yeah, he, he wanted to, them to mediate his rule, right? We would talk about the creation mandate. And so we see that idea that really ties in very closely with what a kingdom is. And then it's not very long before you encounter the nation of Israel. And out of that nation, God establishes a monarchy. He establishes a throne. And eventually you come to realize that that throne is going to be an everlasting throne. That's not because David is an everlasting person. That's not because there is some merely human ruler that will occupy that position indefinitely. That's because Jesus himself will one day occupy that throne. And so you see from the very beginning this emphasis on this matter of a kingdom. Now, as we think about the structure of the Bible, the progress of this kingdom throughout history can be underlined using three major headings, three major categories. Some of you have heard these before. The first one is very simply creation. God establishes a realm over which to rule. But then what happens next? That's where the rebellion starts. And at that, at that point, you have now this obstacle to God's rule. And the question is, what is going to happen in response to that? And ultimately, the answer to that is redemption. God provides a way to redeem this world that is cursed and to redeem fallen human beings. And so that is the ultimate solution to this rebellion that we see taking place all around us. And because of that, because we are in this state of progress, we understand that the kingdom does exist, but it doesn't yet exist in its final, fullest sense. So the question is, when will the kingdom exist in its final, fullest sense? What do you think? Well, you, pro you probably have an opinion about that. As it happens, theologians have opinions about that too. So that brings up this matter of the timing of the kingdom. And there are three basic options here. Option number one, premillennialism. Have you heard that term before? Okay, millennialism having to do with the millennium, this thousand year period where Jesus is said to reign in the book of Revelation, and pre having to do with before. So premillennialism is the belief that Christ returns before setting up his millennial kingdom. And then after that return, he is now reigning during a literal 1,000 year period. Does that sound familiar to you? 
Have you heard that, that understanding taught? That, I think, is definitely the strongest influence that we have in our congregation theologically as we think about these options. Post-millennialism. What does post mean? It means after, right? And so the belief of post-millennialism is that Christ returns after the church has ushered in his millennial kingdom. That's a little bit different viewpoint, isn't it? It still holds to the idea that Jesus is going to return, but it suggests that the church is already building and experiencing the millennial kingdom. And it's only at the end of that that we actually get to see Jesus in person in the flesh. Well, there is one more option. Amillennialism. Again, having to do with the millennium, but that idea of being amillennial has to do with the idea that that Christ never actually returns to set up a literal millennial kingdom. Now, I want to clarify that this does not mean that amillennialists believe that Jesus will not return. They do believe that Jesus will return. They just don't believe that there is a literal 1,000-year period in which he in which he reigns over this earth in this in the sense that we we understand and interpret the book of revelation to mean. So as you look at these options, what do you think? Is there one that strikes you as being the best explanation of what the bible says about the future, the nature of the kingdom? I think there's one that you and I are naturally most most comfortable with, right? And it is it is indeed that that first one, premillennialism that Christ returns and then He sets up his millennial kingdom. And that is the view that I have. All three views may be held by genuine Christians. This is not a matter of salvation or being lost. Um, But the position we take does have an impact. So these are things that matter because it affects your interpretation of the Bible and it affects your understanding of the end times. So as we go back here, to these, to these three basic options. I, I, want, I want to linger on them just a little bit more so we can understand how this affects our understanding of the Bible. If you believe that Christ returns before setting up his millennial kingdom, what does that mean is the next thing that you're expecting? Yeah, you're expecting the return, right? That's what you are looking for. That's, that's what you are longing for. And you are not necessarily expecting things to get better in this world, are you? In fact, you're not really surprised when it looks like things are continuing to spin out of control because ultimately you know that the solution to the problems of sin in this world, that that is only going to come through Jesus' reign when he comes and puts an end to that rebellion. So that makes an awful lot of sense when you think about that. That also has an impact when we think about our understanding of the future for the nation of Israel. Do you believe that God is done with the nation of Israel? Yeah. That probably means that you're a premillennialist, whether you would have expressed it in those terms or not, because the millennium that we believe is future gives us an opportunity to see God restore the nation of Israel to fulfill those promises that he made in the very beginning um, that he gave to his people. So that's going to have an impact on your understanding of the future. As we think about postmillennialism, the history of postmillennialism is interesting. It actually became very popular in the days leading up to the 20th century. And then as the 20th century hit, it became far less popular. Any ideas as to why that might have been the case? Yeah, seeing an entire world at war, seeing a a great pandemic, seeing, uh, seeing a great depression, all of these things coming together at the beginning of that period of the 20th century, people looked at that and they said, you know what, I actually don't think this world is getting better. And so that, that kind of was the death knell to this, this idea of post-millennialism. You'll still occasionally run into someone like that, but it's not very common because people recognize that history does not consistently show that our world is just getting better and better and better, and it's only a matter of time, matter of time until Jesus comes back as the cherry on top of it all, right? That's just not the way that we see the world that we live in. So post-millennialism has really become much less a factor when it comes to this discussion than it used to be. Interestingly enough, though, to me, it still lingers in some of the language that we find ourselves using, and it actually lingers a little bit in our hymn book. And I I can think of several hymns right right off the top of my head that I always always sort of am taken aback by whenever we sing them. And I think, for instance, of the song, Lead On, O King Eternal. And there's a middle stanza of that song, and it says, For not with swords loud clashing nor roll of stirring drums, but with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. 
Now, of course, you don't have to read that in a post-millennial sense. You can read that in a sense that um, holds to premillennialism. But that is the idea of post-millennialism, that Christ will not come with the loud clashing swords, but that you usher in the kingdom of Christ by doing all of these good deeds and by making the world a better place. Another song that strikes me that way is, um, For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. It's a song that that gives us this idea of a gradually growing awareness of the kingdom, right? And then all of a sudden, at the end of this, we have Christ here. So it it is interesting that sometimes that theology does affect the songs that we sing. And if you enjoy and appreciate those songs, I'm not mentioning that to critique you in any way. I enjoy and appreciate them too. But sometimes those songs expose these doctrinal issues that do come up as we grapple with interpreting uh, interpreting the details of Scripture. Now, amillennialism, on the other hand, is very common in the church today. And so if, if you interact, if you rub shoulders with very many Christians that are outside of our congregation or congregations like ours, there's a good chance that you know a number of amillennialists. And as I've said, these are, these are genuine Christians. These are people who believe in the inspiration and authority of Scripture, but they read their Bibles in a very different way. And so you come to this matter of the millennium. And to see this, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. This is, this is the most extended section where we see reference to this millennial kingdom. And once we get to Revelation 20, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. And then I'm going to keep on reading. And I would like you to count, if you would, as we read through this passage together, see how many references there are to this 1,000-year period as we go through these verses. Revelation chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands." They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. To prepare them for battle, their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night. So the question is, what would you do with a passage like that if you were an amillennialist? And the answer is, you will read a passage like that symbolically. You will say that this passage symbolizes Jesus' reign in this earth right now. And that it is fulfilled symbolically by the fact that the kingdom does exist. And Jesus is currently reigning. How many references to that 1,000 year period did you find as we were reading through there? Did you come up with six? Okay, good. That was what I came up with as well. And so the question that comes to my mind as, as we look at a passage like this is, What if God meant to communicate that there was an actual 1,000-year period? How else could he have made that clear other than repeating it six separate times? Again, when we talk about people who hold to this amillennial position, they they believe the Bible is inspired, they believe it's authoritative, they're Christians, but I, I don't understand that method of interpretation that looks at a passage like this and concludes automatically Well, it must be symbolic. Why does it have to be symbolic? God has given promises. He has given prophecies in the past that have come literally to pass in great detail. And when God makes something so excessively clear as as he does here in Revelation 20, 
my instinct is to assume that he's actually going to do it. And that, of course, goes very well with the idea that one day God will completely and finally fulfill all of his promises to the nation of Israel. This provides a wonderful window, a wonderful opportunity for him to do those things that we believe that he is going to do. And so you can tell by now very clearly which, which side I line up on as we think about this matter of premillennialism versus postmillennialism versus amillennialism. I do believe that premillennialism is the best view. And one reason that I very strongly believe that is because it doesn't allow people to play fast and loose with God's promises. How does that happen in this whole discussion? Well, God gives a promise to the nation of Israel, you and I come along as the church thousands of years later, and then people say God doesn't have to fulfill that promise to the nation of Israel, he just transferred it to to us as the church. There's a spiritual fulfillment to which I say, but I wasn't the one he gave the promise to, right? And when we look at those unconditional covenants, those unconditional promises of the Old Testament, what happens if 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 a covenant is unconditional and somebody breaks it and they lose the benefits of that promise it doesn't happen right that is that is a a, that is a covenant that must be fulfilled that is an impossibility that promise has to be fulfilled and it has to be fulfilled regardless of the actions of the person who may have not behaved the way they were supposed to do. So I don't think it works very well for us to say that God fulfills all of those promises to you and me spiritually. That that just doesn't sit well with me as I think about what the Bible says about God's faithfulness to his promises. And other other premillennialists have have arrived at that same conclusion. Another issue I have with these other positions that I think premillennialism solves is that it allows for a consistent method of Bible interpretation. When you read the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans... How do you interpret what he says? You read it. You interpret it literally. You basically assume that he means what he says, right? Well, if you were an all-millennialist, you accept that. But then you come to the book of Revelation, and what do you do? Now you have a completely different hermeneutic. You have a completely different method of interpretation, right? And so one of the advantages of premillennialism is that it allows us to basically read the Bible as normal human literature and to accept it at face value. Now, we understand that, of course, there are different genres in the Bible that we have to interpret a little bit differently. We understand that there are figures of speech. It is not about denying that there is symbolic language in Scripture, but we basically expect to be able to read our Bible the way we read other literature and to take it at face value. By the way, that has an impact on your view of the end of the book. It also affects your view of the beginning of the book, doesn't it? Because you expect to read Genesis 1 through 11 and interpret it at face value and not come up with an explanation for how this is just a big myth that teaches some sort of a general spiritual truth, right? So this is something that does affect both ends of the Bible as we think about it as a whole book. Well, that brings us to another thing that I wanted to address with us tonight, and that is the distinction between dispensationalism and covenant theology. And I don't know if these are new terms to us tonight, but this is, this is an opportunity for us to be exposed to these, to these different positions um, if you've not necessarily wrestled with it very much before. And what this is, is it basically two different systems of Bible interpretation. Um, so you look at your Bible through the lens of either dispensationalism or covenant theology, and that will lead to different interpretations of passages. So that's why this matters, because it affects the way that we interpret our Bibles. So here's what this is a debate about. The debate between covenant theology and dispensationalism is about continuity versus discontinuity. What is that? Well, if something is continuous, it runs together. There are similarities, right? If there is discontinuity, that means that it doesn't run together. It means that there are differences. And so the reason why I say that right out of the gates is because sometimes if you've not been exposed to this before, you say, well, but I I believe in covenants because the Bible talks about covenants, right? Is that what this is a debate about? No, because dispensationalists and covenant theologians both believe in con- both believe in covenants. The same thing is true with this matter of dispensations. So if you're talking to somebody who believes in covenant theology, they do believe that something critical and distinct happened at the moment when Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and at the moment when the church was established. They recognize that there are differences between different time periods 
of history. So this is not about the existence of covenants. It's not about the existence of dispensations. It's about whether when you take your Old Testament on the one hand and your New Testament on the other, you see them as being very, very similar and you notice lots and lots of similarities or whether you notice some key distinctions, some key differences between the two. And so that really is what this argument is about. And and it leads to some very specific kinds of discussions. So does the church equal Israel? Or is it distinct from Israel? Is that a question that you have an opinion, of, an opinion on one way or another? If so, then, then you've, you've grappled with this matter of dispensational theology versus covenant theology. Dispensational theology recognizes distinctions. Again, discontinuity between Israel and the church. So again, that means that the church can't just take Israel's promises and say, okay, that's okay, God's fulfilled them, he's given them to us, right? Because it recognizes that those are two distinct organizations. Here's another question. Is there a future for national Israel? Or have God's promises to Israel been transferred to the church? That's that's a question that grows directly out of this matter of dispensationalism, which recognizes some distinctions in the way God has organized the various periods of human history and covenant theology, which tends to sort of make those bleed more together. Replacement theology, by the way, is the belief that the church has replaced Israel. So God is done with them as a nation, and we don't expect to see any sort of future for them as a, na- as a national ethnic group. Now, you could believe in replacement theology and still accept that Jews might come to know Christ as their Savior, right? Then they get to be a part of the church. But you don't anticipate that there is going to be a future for Israel as a nation. I have a real issue with that when it comes to interpreting Romans 9 through 11. When you read Romans 9 through 11, I think it's very clear that God has a future in mind for the nation of Israel. Now, we as Gentiles, as the church, we have been grafted in. We are a part of that larger category of the people of God throughout human history. But there is a distinction, nevertheless, between uh, the church and Israel. And I think that that's going to become apparent in the, in the end times. Now, as we move along thinking about this matter of dispensationalism and covenant theology, again, the difference here is whether you emphasize a matter of continuity or discontinuity. That's that's what this comes down to. Uh, There are different degrees within dispensationalism and within covenant theology. And so, for instance, if you think about covenant theology, there are people who adhere to what we call progressive covenant theology. Those people are pretty close to being dispensationalists, right? Right? That's, in other words, they're not that dissimilar from people that are kind of towards the middle on that, on that particular issue. But now, as you go to traditional covenant theology, this tends to come out of traditional Reformed churches like the Presbyterian Church, um, the Christian Reformed Church. You go back to John Calvin, guys like that. Um, this, is, this is definitely more along the lines of believing that the church has replaced Israel, that, that, kind, of, that kind of a position of interpretation. And then finally we get this thing called theonomy. Anybody know what theonomy is? This is the belief that we need to reinstitute the observance of the Old Testament law. That it it needs to actually be reincorporated into our society today. Uh, It comes from uh, theo, of course, having to do with with God. Uh, uh, The nami part having to do with namas. That's the Greek word for law. So having to do with reinstituting God's law. That's the extreme end of covenant theology. As we look at dispensationalism, there are also some variations under dispensationalism. There is ultra-dispensationalism, which is not very common, um, and I would suggest is not very biblical. That's not something I'm going to advocate for tonight. Then there is what people have referred to as classic dispensationalism. Anybody recognize that name, Schofield? Yeah, some of you from, from your own personal experience, right? Because Schofield is best known for his reference Bible, and that became very popular in the years prior to World War I and and many decades after that. And he would have been what we would consider a classic dispensationalist. Uh, Louis Berry Schaefer would have been been another um, classic dispensationalist. Well, as the 20th century moved on, other dispensationalists came along and they sort of revisited the ideas that these earlier theologians had been hashing out. And so they developed what has come to be known as revised dispensationalism. So we have men like Ryrie, Charles Ryrie. Many of you have read some of his books, or perhaps you have used his study Bible. 
Uh, John Walvert, he, is, uh, he was a prof at Dallas Theological Seminary and wrote many, many books and articles on end times events. And then Michael Vlach is a, a newer author who I have benefited from personally. If you ever have the opportunity to read something by him, I have found his writing on these issues to be very helpful. Uh, this is a, sort of an artificial category I bring up just because this comes from my experience. So I went to Bob Jones University for both my undergraduate degree and my graduate degrees, and they claim that their seminary is moderate dispensationalist. And I put that in quotes because I, I do think it's sort of humorous because if you say that something is moderate, it just sort of assumes that you're the one who has the right sort of balanced view, right? Um, but it does, it does pretty accurately describe their understanding of the version of dispensationalism that they're preaching. It doesn't go all the way into this next category we're going to see, but it maybe does step a little bit beyond what you've seen from somebody like a Ryrie or a Walvard. Yes, sir? Okay. Yes. So, for instance, ultra-dispensationalists will actually make the claim that uh, the Gospels and the Book of Acts are not relevant for the church because they don't believe that the church was started in Acts 2 at Pentecost. And so by introducing more divisions into the New Testament, they end up actually considering a whole chunk of the New Testament to basically be irrelevant for us as Christians. And it can lead to some other weird practical beliefs as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. In theory, you, you could just keep on adding on dispensation after dispensation. Yeah. Um, um, cer certainly, ultra-dispensationalism goes beyond that traditional seven or eight category listing. Now, classic dispensationalism, that's right where that group is. Revised dispensationalism is very friendly to that. When you come down to progressive dispensationalism, there's a little bit less emphasis on that list of seven. And so progressive dispensationalism, it has to do with the idea that um, Jesus is, uh, is currently reigning on David's throne. That's not something traditional dispensationalists have agreed with historically. And so not everyone has ma made that jump to identify as a progressive dispensationalist. But that became a big thing back in the 80s. Um, when Bach and Blazing and Saucy began writing about that issue. So these are all different, different options on that spectrum of continuity versus discontinuity. Once again, genuine believers land on both sides and different places of the spectrum here. And so some of my very favorite theologians, my very favorite authors are covenant theologians, and, and con convictionally so. But again, the way that you view this matter of continuity versus discontinuity in your Bible, it is going to impact the way you read and apply it. So for instance, the Old Testament tells us that there is such a thing as a Sabbath. And it is something God's people were commanded to keep. Are you and I today observing a Christian Sabbath on Sundays? Covenant theologians will probably say yes, because they see a connection running straight from the Old Testament right through the New Testament. But dispensationalists are much more likely to say, we don't read anything about that in the New Testament. In fact, we see Jesus fulfilling the law, and that seems to have applied to Israel. So they see a discontinuity. They see a division between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So that's just a very practical application. Now, what happens if you go pretty far on the extreme of the dispensational side? Well, you get people saying things like, the Sermon on the Mount is not for us as Christians. That's only something for the future. And I think that that goes beyond what is warranted as we notice the distinctions between different periods of time in biblical history. So I believe that dispensationalism is the best system for interpreting and applying the Bible. Um, maybe something between revised dispensationalism and progressive dispensationalism. I'm not totally sold on every aspect of progressive uh, dispensationalism, but that's basically where I see myself as lining up. And if you want to learn more about that, I have a book that I've been looking at this week by Michael Vlock on dispensationalism. It's not very long, and that's basically where he lands. So if you want to know more information about dispensationalism, that might be something that you could consider checking out. And that has the advantage of being a recent book, and so he's able to discuss some of the recent trends within dispensationalism. Well, you and I have spent a lot of time tonight talking about some fairly abstract theological concepts. 
Some of you I can tell hung with me. It's, it's a difficult thing for some of us to really track with these things. And some of us find ourselves just feeling like, okay, is this really relevant for me? Do I really have to think about these things? To which, you know, I would refer us to the discussion at the beginning of the message, just that, that God does reveal to us information about these things. And so it is appropriate for us to exert some effort to try to understand them and to learn from them. But to boil it all down, regardless of where you fall on these issues, we, are, we understand very clearly that you and I are to live as citizens of another kingdom. That is our calling, and that is our hope. And to close out the service tonight, I'm going to have us turn to Colossians chapter 3. And we're just going to look at the first four verses of this chapter. Colossians 3. You and I are living for another kingdom. That is our hope. That is the great thing that we should be pursuing with our lives. And so Colossians 3 verse 1 says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, is that you? I trust it is. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That is our destination. That is what we are called to live for. That is what we are called to pray for. Remember what Jesus said in the prayer he taught his disciples. Your kingdom come. And so whether, whether you feel like you fully grasp the things that we've talked about tonight, whether you feel you're, like your mind is a little bit boggled, we don't need to be boggled when it comes to this matter of living for the kingdom that is to come, that Jesus has already instituted and is already, is already bringing to its fulfillment and will one day bring to its complete fulfillment. You and I can live for and pursue that kingdom right here, right now. We can do that in the choices that we make this week. And so I trust that that will be an encouragement to you as you try to orient your life priorities in a way that honors what God is ultimately doing in this world. Well, as we conclude our service tonight, I'd like us to sing a closing song. And we'll go ahead and move along to that. We're going to sing, Jesus Shall Reign. And I believe that's 231. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, it's 231. So let's go ahead and stand together as we sing. And as we praise the Lord for his reign, as we look forward to the reign of Jesus over this world, Jesus shall reign.
Amen to that. May we live as citizens of another kingdom as we go into this week. Thank you. You are dismissed.